Before I begin, let's have just another short word of prayer. Our dear and loving Heavenly Father, indeed we are so very thankful that you bless the different outreaches that go all around this country and all around the world. And now, Lord, we pray that you'll bless this meeting today with your Holy Spirit. This we ask in Jesus' dear and loving name. Amen. You know, this is a, a time that comes around about every four years. And it's a time that comes around when people like me are reminded about just how bad a shape we're in. You know, the, Olymp the Olympics just finished, and, you know, they set new Olympic and world records. Uh, you know, we felt awe and respect for the hard work and the training that the athletes exhibited. Not so much, though, for the planners of that Christ-mocking open ceremonies. But, you know, that had nothing to do with the athletes. By the way, I read the other day that uh, that guy who put together that drag queen Lord Supper was struck by lightning. Now, I don't know if that's true, but if not, it'd be a good lesson for others that might want to mock God. The American athletes made the USA proud of their showings, you know, winning more medals than any other country. Now, no, not all won medals. There were some complete failures, but I didn't see any quit or slack in their performances. And how about the women's gymnastic team, Simone Biles? You know, simply amazing. And that swimmer, Katie Ledecky, a true champion. And the American track and field team did great too. But the one that impressed me the most was that beautiful Sydney McLaughlin Levon. Not only did she shatter her own world record in the 400-meter uh, hurdles, and then she ran the second leg of the 4x4 relay, 4x4 run, 100, uh, 4 by 400 relay, where the Americans won by five or six seconds. But what she said later tells me more about her than winning any race. She said in, her, in an interview later, what I have in Christ is far greater than what I have or don't have in life. He has prepared me for a moment such as this, that I may use the gifts that he has given me to point all the attention back to him. Now, whenever I think about the Olympics, I think about uh, you know some of the older champions. Uh, Jim Thorpe. Jim Thorpe's uh, life story was the first book I can ever remember reading all the way through. But one that re has really always impressed me was Jesse Owens. Now, Jesse Owens won four gold medals at the 1936 Olympics, and he really spoiled Hitler's claim of having developed a super, a super race. Now, his is a great story, and you need to read his uh, biography sometime if you get a chance, or I understand that uh, PBS has put together a documentary about him. Uh, he's really a special person all through his life. Uh, grew up a uh, uh, sharecropper, family, uh, poor, but he uh, went on to uh, become an American champion. But the thing that impressed me most about him was his Christian integrity. You know, it's a long story, but, you know, after winning the gold medals in Berlin, he was naturally, a, uh, he was naturally famous in the United States. But being a black man during that period of time, he didn't receive the respect that he would have today. Now, he received a lot of bad financial advice that got him in trouble with the IRA and, uh, I mean, the IRS, and caused him some hard times. But one, one time, he was told what sounded like a good investment. He was given several thousand dollars by a friend of his for this project. Now, the one that told him about it never got around to doing it and told him that all the investor's money had been spent. Now, whenever he told uh, his investor about what happened, he assured him that he'd get his money back 
but it would take some time. And eventually it was all paid back. Yeah, he could have said, oh, it's already been spent. You're just out of luck, buddy. But he was a real Christian. He did the right thing. Now, he was reduced to things like running exhibition races with horses at the state fair uh, to raise money, things like that. But he repaid every dollar. And that's how a real Christian takes care of their business. They don't con people and then act like nothing's happened. You know, like he, uh, well, there's one quote in there. He said something about you don't have to have a mask and a gun to uh, break the Eighth Commandment. He's a super special fella. Now, for the last several years, though, and I tell my body to run and jump and lift and punch. And my body says, who me? You got to be kidding. You know, I tried to argue with it, but it's gotten kind of stubborn. You know, most of us have found that as we age, our, our bodies keep repeating more and more. You've got to be kidding. As much as we hate it, as we age, our bodies don't respond as well as they once did. And most of us are not into any kind of exercise except to that hand-to-mouth exercise at the dinner table. <laughs> you know, I've always figured if potlucks were Olympic events, we'd probably have some medal contenders last, last week. <laughs> Thousands of people attended the Olympics in Paris, and thousands of dollars were spent by a lot of them to get there. You know, a nonstop uh, round-trip ticket probably cost about $6,000. In a low-level uh, hotel room, about $500 a night, or up to about $4,000 a night, some hooty tooty hotel. You know, there was a wide range of tickets for the events, too, about $40 and up. But for the opening ceremonies, they were $90 to $2,900. And the closing ceremonies were $45 to $1,700. I guess that's why most folks watch the Olympics on television. I think the most important thing about the Olympics, though, is the people. People from all over the world competing in a sport they love and have talent in. But most of the people are just like us. They've just been blessed with a different talent than we've been given. We watch in admiration and appreciation. You know, we may even somewhat be inspired to do more with our life, to work harder, things like that. Inspiration often produces motivation. When someone does a good job, they inspire us to do the same. And we give thanks to God for being alive and being part of this great country, this great place where we can have opportunity in abundance. God uses athletes, uh, I mean athletics, in his word to describe the Christian life. You know, life can be like the Olympics in many ways. You know, we need to consider maybe the sports, the training, the spectators, the rules, and the rewards. You know, the, in the, the sports, I don't know how many different events or type of sports there were in the Summer Olympics, but I know that there was plenty. You know, something for everybody to watch and enjoy. Now, during uh, a survey, 45% of the people said they liked the gymnastics the best. But then, of course, whenever the track and field uh, events got started, you know, we're amazed. Some events like running and wrestling are mentioned in the Bible and do remind us of the Christian life. Uh, let's look at Ephesians, uh, Ephesians, the sixth chapter, verse 12. See what they say concerning wrestling. Ephesians 6, verse 12. Ephesians 6, 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You know, professional wrestling is something I really don't enjoy much. You know, it's more entertainment and craziness than wrestling. But the Olympic wrestling is real stuff. In fact, a lot of the top MMA fighters have a, a real strong wrestling background. And be aware, the wrestling match that we're involved in is real stuff too. Paul said that we're in a wrestling match with the powers of the dark world. That's namely Satan. Now, Teddy Roosevelt had a, a little dog one time that was always getting into fights and he's always getting licked. And somebody told him, so, uh, you know, he's not much of a fighter, is he? Mr. Roosevelt said, oh, yeah, he's a good fighter. He's just... A, a bad judge of other dogs. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, if you're a poor judge of dogs, you're going to get licked. 
And you know I'm not talking about dogs. I'm talking about Satan. If you think he's a pushover, you're the one who's going to get pushed over. Satan is a lot stronger and wiser than you are. And there's no way in the world that you're going to whip him by yourself. James 4, 7 says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. But how do you resist the devil? By doing what Peter says in uh, 1 Peter 5, 9. Resist him standing firm in the faith. Now, how do you resist Satan? Well, keep the Sabbath. Go to church regularly and faithfully. Stay in God's word. Pray without ceasing. Do anything and everything that, that deals with your Christian faith. That's how you can resist the evil one. When you fill your life with the good things of God, there'll be no room for his evil. In the Olympics, also there's plenty of running. I've heard it said that the Christian life is sim uh, similar to running a foot race. Uh, let's go back and look at 1 Corinthians 9, 24 again. First Corinthians 9, 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. And then Paul says in uh, 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. To most people, you know, long distance running is maybe running a mile. You know, but that's child plays for an actual distance runner. Uh, running a mile just kind of warming up. Of course, the Olympics have all kinds of distances, uh, all the way from 100 meters to over 26-mile marathon. Now, I never could run in all my life. I never run long distances. But I did make the track coach do a double take one time whenever he saw me outrun one of his uh, top sprinters. You know, he talked to me about the track team, but I wasn't interested in, in that. When my son Wade was on the track team, he found out that it's not just the fun of running a race. There's a lot of running every day. And, you know, that kind of stuff just wasn't for me. I really wish that the Christian life was just a short sprint. You know, personally, I think it would be a lot easier to finish if it was, but it's not. You know, the Christian life can be more of a marathon race. It's a long race, a hard race. It's one thing to enter a marathon, but it's another thing to finish the race. And there are many people who jump on the Jesus bandwagon, but they never finish the race. There are many people who walk down the church aisle, confess their faith in Christ and are baptized into Christ, but eventually drop out of the race for what, what one reason or another. In marathon running, it's called uh, hitting the wall, which is usually about the 20 mile mark. That's when a runner feels like he's just totally out of gas. And life is full of hitting the wall experiences. You know, death of a loved one, divorce, fires, floods, disasters like Hurricane, you know, Ike, Katrina, Harvey, and Beryl. You know, the Christian life can be a tough act, but life is a tough act. You know, we need to give support to one another as best we can, not to the least that we can. Remember, several years ago, there was, a, in, it was a, another marathon, and getting close to the finish line, a runner uh, just totally couldn't go any further and collapsed. Well, two other runners who knew that this person was fixing to win the, the race picked them up and helped them across the, the uh, finish line. And also in the 1968 Olympics in Mexico, there was a marathon runner who fell in, uh, from Tanzania, I think, fell and hurt, hurt himself really bad. And, but he was bloody, limping, he entered the stadium, you know, far behind anybody else. And there's only a few thousand people uh, left in the stadium. He was asked by a reporter why he continued to run. And he said, my country did not send me 5,000 miles to start the race. They sent me to finish the race. What do you say? You know, let's set our minds and hearts to finishing the race and helping all others finish as well. But, you know, it takes training. Now, remember uh, 1 Corinthians 9.25 said, everyone who competes in the game goes into strict training. As I said before, hard training never interests me, but to compete in the Olympics, it means many years of hard work. A lot of those athletes have devoted their whole lives to just one thing. 
They spend hours every day for several years training for their sport. It's tough, physical, and mental work. It's a lifestyle, not just exercise. But then don't forget about the spectators. Now, Hebrews 12.1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. You know, spectators play an important part of the Olympic Games also. The cheering and the encouragement of the spectators mean a lot to the athletes. You know, everyone needs to be a cheerleader of sorts because we all need encouragement in this tough course called life. What if no one ever said anything good to you in life? Little things like, I hope you're having a great day or, you look nice today. Uh, thank you for what you did. And thanks for serving. You know, things like that. You know, it's hard to function without encouragement or praise or pat on the back. It seems hard to believe, but I heard one time about an elder that sailed, uh, served in his church for many, many years. Finally, one day, somebody came up to him and said uh, how much they appreciated something that he did. They said that, his eyes got misty. He said, you know, I've been an elder in this church for over 30 years. And this is the first time anybody ever said anything good to me. If that's true, what a shame. But obviously, he wasn't part of this congregation. When was the last time you said something encouraging to someone in church for their service, no matter how small it was? True, some people feel the need to point out what they do just so they'll get a pat on the back. And nobody should serve the Lord for praise or receive praise, but everyone needs encouragement to keep on serving. You know, even our pastor. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's his job. He's paid a salary to lead this church, but I'm sure he could use a little encouragement and praise from time to time also. Uh, let's take our Bibles and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. Because one very important part of competition is the athletes have to follow the rules. 2 Timothy 2, verse 5. It says, And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. Now what that basically says is, if anyone competes as an athlete, he do does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. All of, at the uh, Athens uh, Olympics back in 2004, two of the uh, Greek uh, medal winners pulled out of the games and they were disqualified. They were disqualified for refusing to take the drug test that every winner is compelled uh, to take. It made officials wonder if the medals that they'd won in the past could have been tainted by drugs also. Some said it was a setup, but one businessman said justice has been served. It looks like they did something wrong because there's an old Greek saying that says, a clear sky is not afraid of thunder. You know, also at the games in uh, Rio 2018, you probably remember, there's a whole chunk of Russians that weren't allowed to compete due to doping. And if I understand right, Russia was totally banned from the Winter Olympics in 2018 because of that doping. Now, trying to cheat is going against the rules. You know, athletes don't make the rules, just as we Christians don't make the rules when it comes to the Christian life. We may try to make our own rules, but it doesn't work. God makes the rules, and we have to play according to them. Otherwise, we can be disqualified uh, for the crown of life. And what's the greatest rule that God has given? I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. The non-Christian world thinks that we're bigoted whenever it comes to faith in Christ, but it's God himself who made this rule. We only acquire the crown of life through faith in Christ, trusting in who he is and what he did for us on the cross. The rule means that God gets the glory, not us. You know, like the old hymn says, when all my labors and trials are o'er, and I am safe on that beautiful shore. Just to be near the dear Lord I adore will through the ages be glory for me. When by his grace I shall look on his face, that will be glory, be glory for me. 
That means we'll be so excited when we get to heaven, we'll be shouting and singing hallelujah and glory, glory, glory when we're on those golden streets and whenever we see Jesus face to face. But God gets the credit for our, our, our salvation. God gets the glory because He did it all. If we were to win the crown by what we did, we would get the glory. And this is not how the game is played or is finished. It is God who loves, not mankind. It is God who sacrificed and gave His very best, not us. He sets the rules. He gets the glory. However, when we play by His rule, we get the crown of life, the joy of heaven, the gold medal. All that hard work and training can have great rewards. You know, Philippians 3.14 says, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Obviously, the goal in the Olympics is to win the gold medal, or any medal would be fine. What's sad is coming in fourth, one hundredth of a second behind the bronze medal winner. We all prefer, uh, prefer the gold, but sometimes we think we have to settle for less. Well, we don't. If anyone ever wins more gold, uh, Olympic gold medals or Olympic medals than Michael Phelps, it'll take a long time. You know, I always marvel at the thousands of athletes around the world who are working and training for years, just as hard as the Olympians, but they don't quite have what it takes to win. Well, the beauty of the Christian life, however, is that we're not striving to win a gold medal. All we have to do is finish the race, and God is going to give us a crown of glory that will last forever. And it's for everyone who crosses the finish line. Uh, now let's look at 1 Corinthians 9.25 again. First Corinthians 9.25 says, Everyone who competes in the game goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Your Revelation 2.10 says, Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. That's a crown that we're shooting for. It's lasting. It's eternal. It's never-ending. It's glorious far better than any gold medal award here on earth. An executive headhunter uh, liked to do what he called disarm his prospect. He, he'd offer him a cup of coffee and, you know, take off his coat and tie it, put, put his feet up and talk about baseball, football, family, whatever, until he was totally relaxed. And then he'd look him straight in the eye and ask him, what's your purpose in life? He said it was amazing how many top executives fell apart at that question. But he said one time, his interviewing man had him all relaxed, and he leaned over and asked him, said, what's your purpose in life, Bob? And he said, without blinking an eye, he said, to go to heaven and take as many people with me as I can. Brothers and sisters, right now I want to finish, or I want to cross the sermon finish line right now, this Sabbath, with this question. What's your purpose, your ultimate purpose, your goal in life? Our goal in life isn't winning gold medals, no matter what form they may take, you know, making money, having fun, chasing rainbows, or whatever. Our ultimate purpose, our goal in life, should be the same as that executive, heaven, and to take as many people as possible with us. Let's not run and live our lives in such a way as to get that prize. We need to all run and get that prize. Then that will be glory glory for us too. Let's all pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for your strength and your love. And we pray, Lord, that you'll touch each heart. Help us to be able, Lord, to turn our hearts and our thoughts to you because indeed you are the one, Lord, who gets the glory. This we ask in Jesus' dear name. Amen.